loud. You ready to start? Yeah, no, yeah, no, no. Hey. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. All right, welcome to Kids Sing Tonight. Now, i got to show you parents and adults something, because this morning... Lily Hagen told me that she was going to bring her fuzzy caterpillar, and we're going to sing that here. And so I thought, well, she's just going to, you know, bring her fuzzy caterpillar. Can I show him your fuzzy caterpillar? <laughs> Look at this. She actually brought her fuzzy caterpillar. That is really cool. So she wants to sing the song, so let's sing it. Fuzzy caterpillar climbing up a tree. He wiggled short, he wiggled long, he wiggled straight at me. I put him in a box. Now don't go away, I said. But when I opened up the box, a butterfly instead. Now I could never make one, not even if I tried. For only God in heaven can make a butterfly. All right, I'm going to do something a little different tonight with Kids Sing. Instead of, now we're going to look at our card here in a minute. You've been doing really good with these books of the Bible. I'm just going to ask you some random Bible trivia and just see how much y'all know, all right? Just kind of get those wheels turning up here, all right? Let me start with an easy one. What is... The very first book of the Bible. Yeah, say it loud. Genesis. Genesis, all right? Genesis. What is the very last book of the Bible? Revelation. Who else knows it? Revelation. Revelation, all right? What is the very first book of the New Testament? Matthew. 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 Who, who back here knows it? What's the very first book of the New Testament? Matthew. What's the very last book of the Old Testament? Yeah, say it. Malachi. Everybody say that together. Malachi. All right, how many books are there in the Bible? 66. How many are in the Old Testament? 39. 39. Everybody say 39. That's the Old Testament, right? So if there's 39, do the quick math in the Old Testament. How many are in the New Testament? 27. Man, y'all are good at math. 27, all right? Man, y'all are tough. I, I got to find a question y'all don't know. Who is the oldest man to ever live? Santa? <laughs> oldest man. He's in the Bible. Uh, good guess. Let me give you a guess. Uh, let me t his name starts with an M. Does that help you at all? All right, let's say this name together. Huh? Methuselah. Everybody say that name together. Methuselah. All right. Bonus question. How old was he? How long did he live? 182 years. Hundred. All right, the real answer is going to blow your mind if that's what y'all think it is. 1,000? That's a really good guess. All right, this is how old Methuselah was. And? Uh-huh. Uh, go, go back one year. Nine. 969 years. Say it with me. 969 years. That's pretty old. All right, let me ask you all another question. Who is the wisest man in the Bible? Good guess. Good guess. 
Solomon. There you go. He wrote three of your Old Testament books. All right, everybody say Solomon. Solomon. That's great. That's great. All right, let's sing some more songs. Let's see who can remember the books that we started learning last Sunday night. We looked at Joshua, the book of Joshua. What book is, uh, what does that cover? If I were to say Joshua, who can tell me the answer? Not that Joshua, but the book Joshua. It's a good name. What does it cover? That's Paul, yep, that's, yep, huh? Conquering Canaan? All right, here's the two parts that Joshua covers. Everybody say conquering Canaan. All right, and dividing the promised land. And dividing the promised land. Say it with me. What is it? Conquering Canaan. And dividing the promised land. That's great. Good job, Nash. All right, now we also looked at Judges and Ruth. Who can remember that? Ju- that's perfect. Great. Joshua through Ruth, or Judges through Ruth. Israel's weakness in Canaan. Who else can tell me? Judges through Ruth. Israel's. Israel's weakness in Canaan. Everybody look up here and say it with me. Israel's. Weakness in Canaan. All right, what book is that? What books? Judges through Ruth. If I were to say Israel's weakness in Canaan, what book? Books. Who can tell me? Right here. Who can tell me? What books? Nobody knows? Judges through Ruth. Who else knows? Judges through Ruth. That's great. Great job. All right. What is God's ideal for marriage? One man, one woman for life. That's right. One man, one woman for life. Great job. Give me high fives right here, both of you. Great job. Great job, Nash. One man, one woman for life. Great job. One man, one woman for life. 
Great, great. Give me a high five right here. All right, who can tell me what true success is? Living your life and going to heaven. What is true success? Well, go on. Going to heaven. That's great. Say it, Daniel. What is true success? Living your life and going to heaven. Great job. All right, I bet you can tell me what true failure is. Living your life and not going to heaven. That's perfect. Give me a high five. What is true failure? Living your life and not going to heaven. Great job. All right, Nash, close this out. Living your life and going to heaven. And not, and not going to heaven. And not going to heaven. All right, great job. Great job, guys. We'll begin worship. to our evening worship service here at the Fayetteville Congregation of the Body of Christ, the church. We hope that everybody's had a good day and certainly hope and pray that everything that takes place in the next hour or so, or a little less, will just confirm what a good day it's been. We, before we begin our worship service, just a few announcements by way of uh, things that we need to remember, keeping tabs on the family here. First of all, uh, the elders and everyone want to express a great big thank you to all the people who made the Kite Day today a, a really successful event, and that includes all of the, the ladies and others who brought food, and there was a, a lot of nice food, really good hot dogs, slaw, uh, chili. Really appreciate that, and especially we appreciate all the families who came just to take advantage of that time to spend a little time together and have some fun. We thank everybody for that. We do want to remember, express our condolences and sympathy to our brother David Lee, who lost his brother within the past week. So we certainly are sorry to hear that, but we're thankful that David Lee is a, a strong person and the strong Christian that he is. Let's continue to pray for Brother Wayne Nash, who has an upcoming heart procedure. That's tomorrow. And I'd ask us to keep in mind, too, all of the families around Middle Tennessee who were victims of uh, this past week's tornadoes. There is a family who are good friends of, of ours from Mount Juliet. One of the deacons there, Mike Kibbe, a really nice guy. They lost their house. And I heard from uh, <laughs> Richard Mears, who has been one of our mission trip partners in Mexico, that the youth minister at the Jefferson Avenue congregation in Cookville, I believe his name was Matt Collins, but they lost a daughter who was killed during the tornado, and I think his wife was seriously injured, and he was in critical condition as of the time. So the uh, event was really uh, deadly, and we certainly want to remember there are many of our brothers and sisters who were affected. Keep those in your prayers. Before we begin our service this evening, our worship, let's pray together shortly. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for giving us a good day, for giving us people who love each other and people who want to love each other because we love you. We pray that you'll help us to learn better all the time how to do that, how to love one another as Jesus has loved us, and you've done that with him and through him. We pray that everything that takes place here this evening will be done in spirit and truth, and that every time we gather to worship, that will be the case, and that will be our desire. We ask for your help in all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our first song, 886. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Jesus is risen from the dead. Hail to Jesus. 
mark in your hymn book, 438. 438. There are a lot of things you ought to run from. The devil's not one of them. That might sound counterintuitive, but let me assure you it's not. Concerning the folks injured in uh, Tennessee, uh, if you have followed the Christian Chronicles website, I think the number of our brethren among the 26 or 7 who were killed, I think the number of our brethren is 7 or 8. Uh, that's an area where the church is numerically strong and many many more were affected we almost you know we had a fuzzy caterpillar a minute ago we almost had a berserk squirrel this morning as well uh, if you're familiar with Ray Stevens Landon had a squirrel with him this morning not a living one a stuffed one but that might have been quite a sight there are a lot of things that it really does make sense to run away from, to flee from. Every godly person, every sensible person ought to flee fornication. That's what the Apostle Paul says that we should do. David, I have laid down the clicker. Did, did you see where I put it? Oh, well, you can advance them for me, Eric. Uh, every sensible person ought to flee from fornication. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18, we ought to flee from idolatry in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 14 because that's antithetical to God. If you turn over to 1 Timothy and start reading in chapter 6, look at verses 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. In those verses, Paul tells us that as Christians, we ought to flee from different doctrines, things that contradict the gospel of Christ. We ought to flee from unsound unhealthy words we ought to flee from questionings and disputes about words that's something we ought to think about maybe we ought to flee from envy and strife and railing and evil surmising evil thinking uh, wrangling a, a get quick rich mind get rich quick mindset something didn't sound right when I said that it took me a second there and we ought to flee from the love of money because it's the root of all evil. He didn't say money is, he said the love of it is. Go over to 2 Timothy though, and he says simply, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, flee from youthful lusts. Run away from all of those things. The Bible says to run from them. But have you ever noticed the Bible never says, Christian, run away from the devil. Flee from the devil. It doesn't say that. In fact, when you take your Bible and turn to James chapter 4 and start reading at verse 1, go down to verse 8, basically it says exactly the opposite. It says that we're to live and behave so that he will run from us. Think about it. James tells us that we can live in a way so that the devil will run from us. Now, if someone's running from us, we don't need to be running from them, do we? Don't run from the devil. When we're in danger, it's natural to run away. That's why there are so many things that, that we're told to flee from, to run away from in the Bible, that list of things that we just, just looked at. What do all those things have in common? Fornication and idolatry and evil surmisings and unsound words and youthful lusts and so forth. What do they have in common? What's the thing that runs through all of them? Each one of them represents an opportunity to sin. Some of them are sin outright in their, in, in the, in their own right. But even if they're not outright sin. They represent an opportunity to sin. Remember what John tells us in 1 John 3 and verse 4 about what sin is? It's transgression, violation of the limits that God has set. Boundaries. How many of us would, would willingly go up or down a mountain highway 
if there were no guardrails to keep us from driving over the edge? Aren't you glad there are guardrails? God has given us guardrails to keep us safe. Cross a bridge. What's on either side of the bridge? Guardrails, boundaries. This is where the bridge ends. Don't get over here, you'll fall off. That's what the law of God is. Sin is when we violate those boundaries. When we're in danger, it just makes sense to get out of danger, doesn't it? But the Bible does tell us how we ought to behave when the devil's around us. In James chapter 4 and verse 7, we read, resist, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. But in 1 Peter, Peter says in verses 8 and 9, be sober, be vigilant. That means on your guard, wide awake, on alert. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to mess around with a lion. I, I, I used to, I remember, uh, who, who was the guy in, in Las Vegas, Gunther Gable Williams, that, that used to have the, the lion act, and then there was Siegfried and Roy after that. Those big cats are amazing, but I don't want to, I don't want to pet one. I don't want to play with one. They eat people. I don't want to be, I don't want to be a lion's hairball. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. He's like a, a hungry lion seeking whom he can eat. But Peter goes on and says, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings experienced by your brotherhood are in the world. The same thing you're experiencing, all your brothers and sisters are experiencing. You're not alone. The Greek word, though, that, that is translated resist, uh, and histamine, sounds kind of like an antihistamine, means to be opposed, stand firmly against something. In effect, James and Peter basically are saying, you run right at him, and he'll flee from you. Don't just stand there. Face him down. That's what the inspired writers tell us. Have you ever heard the expression, the best defense is what? A good offense. That's what the Holy Spirit's telling us in James 4 and 1 Peter chapter 2. Take the fight to the devil by actively, deliberately living a holy life. Instead of waiting for him to come to you and test you with temptation. Take the fight to him. When Paul wrote to the Philippians, in Philippians chapter 1, he said he was set for the defense of the gospel. And that's exactly what he was describing. He, he had chosen to be on God's side in this conflict between good and evil. He, he'd chosen his side. He was going to stay on that side and he was going to face down whatever came his way. The Bible never tells us run away from Satan. And we're certainly not supposed to run with him or beside him or, or in, his, in, in his course. But Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 27, we'll start back in verse 25, says that we're not supposed to give him any space in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. Don't reserve a room for him in your mind. Even if you can keep him locked away in that room, he's occupying space that doesn't belong to him. It belongs to God. So don't leave him that space. Paul says to the Ephesians, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. We're members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Don't leave him a spot, even a small one. 
in your life, in your mind, in your heart. He'll try to snare you. He'll try to, to catch you. You go over to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 26, and Paul talks about the, the snare of the devil, and that's the, that's the trigger of a trap. Think about a mouse trap. You take and you, you fold it over and you set it, and then you put the bait on this little lever so that when the mouse just touches it, the trap's got him. The snare is that trigger. And Paul says, Satan will try to snare you. He'll try to catch you with something that, that appeals to you. We're supposed to escape his snare and not be ignorant either of his devices or of his wiles. According to 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11, we're not ignorant of his de You know, God did not create stupid people in this world. He didn't create us to be dumb. He gave us the intellectual ability, the spiritual capacity to recognize when we're being tempted, when we're being led away by lust, when we're being enticed. And so we're supposed to fight against the wiles of the devil, the, the snares, the tricks, the traps that he sets for us, Ephesians 6 and verse 11. But the key to overcoming the evil one is really pretty simple. Go back to James chapter 4 and verse 7. And look at the first part of the verse. The third point is this. Submit to God. We overcome the evil one by submitting to God. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Now that word submit, that's a word that, that, that we need to pay attention to. Because it means to be under the control of another person. It's the same word, identical, here in James chapter 4, as it is in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves, or some translations say, be in subjection unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. But it's a compound word. And the important thing is to see that it tells us who is doing what. To whom. God does not submit us to him. He doesn't make us let him control. And over in Ephesians 5, husbands don't subject their wives. They don't make their wives submit. Some do, but that's wrong for them to. They're bigger, they're stronger, they're meaner, they're tougher. Or at least they think they are. And some men are brutal. God is never brutal with his bride. What Paul tells Christian women is the very same thing that James tells all Christians. You, by your choice, give God control. He doesn't put us into subjection to himself. He doesn't take control from us. That's exactly what the devil would do if he could, but he can't. He would if he could, but he can't. You can resist him. God doesn't take our control. We're to put him, place him in control, submitting ourselves to the Lord by our own choice. In a nutshell, the way we resist the devil is by making sure there's no room, no space left that he can occupy in our lives, in our minds, in our thoughts, in our hearts. Well, how do you do that? You fill yourself up with the things of God. That seems deceptively simple, doesn't it? But you know what? Whenever something's full, there's no more space in it. There's no more room in it. Isn't it interesting that Jesus uses that, that uh, analogy, that, that, that illustration in a sense, when he says in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, Give and it shall be given unto you. Now he's challenging his disciples there. Be like God. 
Give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. That's how God gives. You know, we have a, a trash can in the kitchen. It's the main trash can in the house. And, and, you know, when we put stuff in it, eventually it starts to get, kind of get filled up. But sometimes you put things in the trash can that, that they occupy a lot of volume, but they're not really big things like cereal boxes or things like that. Uh, potato chip bag, something like that. So when it starts to get really full, sometimes what do you do? Pick that foot up, step down and push all that stuff down into the bottom of the bag. And then guess what? I don't have to take the trash out for another 36 hours because there's room in it to put more trash in it. Jesus uses an analogy really of a, I've always thought of it as being like a feed sack. You take the burlap bag and you start to pour stuff in it. And after a while, you, you pick it up and you kind of tamp it on the ground and shake it back and forth so that all that stuff settles back down in it. Then you can pour some more in. And then you do it again and then you can pour some more in. And then you do it again and you keep doing that until it just won't hold another grain. Until it's just running over. All right. How do you resist the devil? Fill yourself so full of God God's not going to force it on you. You have to choose to fill yourself so full of God, so full of the things of God, the, the knowledge of his will, the, the love of God, the, the kindness, the generosity, the goodness of God, that there's just no room for anything else. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul prayed for the Colossian Christians to be filled with the knowledge of his will. You back up to, uh, verse, well, you start at verse 9, go on through verse 10. It says, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding to this end, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Over in Philippians chapter 1, in verses 9, 10, and 11, listen to the words of Paul's prayer for those Christians that were so close to his heart. He said, this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. His desire for the Christians at Ephesus was for them to be filled with all the fullness of God and with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, and chapter 5, verse 18. There's a really very simple point. A very basic point. We'll never overcome temptation or sin by trying to run away from the devil because he's in this world. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 9 and 10, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. That was the issue he was dealing with right then at Corinth. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. In other words, all of that's in the world because Satan's in the world. And he says, since then... <laughs> To, to avoid any association at all, you'd have to go out of the world. You'd have to leave this world. We can't escape the presence of temptation and sin in this world. As long as we're here, we're going to deal with temptation. We're going to deal with sin. We're going to need to flee from fornication and unrighteousness and all of these things, temptation. They're present in our world. But we can ensure that the devil can't control our lives with those things by resisting him through filling our hearts, our minds, our thoughts, our lives with the love and the will of God. We are told, turn and flee 
from all of the devil's tools, all those things that we mentioned back there at the beginning. And don't overlook the fact that one of those is the temptation to put off correcting and making right what we need to do right now, like Felix did in Acts 24 and verse 25. When it's convenient, when it's convenient, no, no. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2 that now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Don't run from the devil. Resist him by filling your life so full of God that there's just no room for him at all. Do you need to resist? Do you need to run right at him, face him down and overcome him by the power of God? God will help. He'll provide what you need. He already has in the person of Jesus. If you need to answer the gospel's invitation to become a Christian as a child of God, to ask for your brothers and sisters to pray with you, maybe as a faithful brother or sister in Christ, simply desiring to be identified as a part of the congregation here. The gospel invitation and our invitation with it is humbly open to you now while we stand as we sing together. As we gather around the Lord's table, I'd like to read a couple verses from Isaiah chapter 53. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, 
Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned from his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, he did not open his mouth. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, let's remember what Christ suffered and went through for us. Let us pray for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this opportunity to gather around the table and remember what Christ has done for us. We just ask that everybody that's partaking of it will think of what that means to them and how that affects them and just help them to have the right attitude and the right heart. In Jesus' name, amen. put a cup. Father, we thank you for this day to remember the sacrifice Christ made on our behalf. And Father, we pray as we are about to uh, examine these emblems that we'll do it in a worthy manner. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. separate from the Lord's Supper, we have an opportunity to give back, so let us give thanks for our blessings. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the many blessings you've given us. We thank you for just the abundance you've given us, and we thank you for just everything. And as we give back to you right now, help us to do it cheerfully and mindfully, and help us to let our hearts express our love to you. In Jesus' name, amen. tonight. Please stand if you're able. We'll have a song and a prayer and then we'll be dismissed. 811. Jesus, Jesus,
Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for the thing we've been able to enjoy this day. We thank you for two wonderful lessons, Father, from Brother Dave. And we pray, Father, that we've committed ourselves to build the church the way you would have it, that we won't be pressured from outside influences. And we ask, Father, that you will strengthen us this week, that we can resist the devil and that we won't flee from him, but cause him to flee from us. Father, we ask you to go with us as we embark on this new week and help us, Father, to be strong influences for you and for the church. Be with us, Father, from this day as we go from here. Continue to guide us, Father, and keep us strong. And these many blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.